Hi, welcome back for the afternoon session of Fault Lines, uh, where we are gathered to talk about events that have occurred in the past and ones which we will continue to witness in the future. Uh, this is a student-led symposium which will focus on conversations around earthquakes, disaster knowledge, legislation and rebuilding. Uh, an earthquake, unpredictable yet inevitable, does not have to be destructive. However, recent incidents prove that without correct preparation of infrastructure or legislation, um, this does not hold true. As we witness the aftermath of major earthquakes around the world, we want to come together to discuss and speculate on our position as students, academics, practitioners. Uh, in, a moment of, in a moment of crisis, uh, we ask, what is our agency? Um, a year ago, we began the preparations of this symposium by organizing a discussion um, together with one of our tutors, Karen Malik, among other relief efforts such, such as a bake sale and a week-long donation run. It was very uh, exhilarating to see how quickly we could come, all come together as a community and how powerful our conversations were in a time of great tragedy. Um, and so with fault lines, today we do not aim to find solutions to the topics discussed, but rather we aim to encourage discussions to question uh, the wider system of an earthquake. In the morning session, we discuss disaster knowledge, legislations, and community resilience in earthquake zones. Following those conversations, this second session will focus on the aftermath of an earthquake, um, community and urban responses, reconstruction, as well as rebuilding. We are joined by guests um, to, who will present the work but also answer any questions about it to shape conversation. But then the floor will be open to any other blank um, or any points that anyone wants to put forward to discuss all together with the room. Again, we do not aim to find solutions, but instead uh, to encourage conversation. And now we're, we're joined by... Uh, actually, before introducing the guests, I would like to point on a small exhibition on the side from Sirkana Darkroom, which is a mobile analog photography project for children residing on the Turkey-Syrian border and also the earthquake zones in Turkey. And it's for children to explore analog photography, learn to capture and develop their own photos. So these photos you see over there, like they belong to children and they were de developed by the children themselves. They couldn't print them on their own, but we did print them. So you can take a look after. So for this session, we're joined by three guests. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Yasem Naktash. She's a lecturer and associate professor in applied materials and structures in the University College London, and an editorial board member for UCL. We shall open a journey for environment-related research. Her research focuses on climate-induced and atmospheric hazards on the built environment. And after that, we're going to listen to Eray Chayla's presentation. He's a professor of human geography in the University of Hamburg with a focus on violence and security in the Anthropocene. He was a guest editor in the Center for Special Justice's publication on earthquakes and their impacts on urban legislation. And after, we have an online guest. Uh, we're going to see him over there. Um, he is Khalil Morad El Gilali. He is also an architect and urban planner with his own practice called Atelier B, an interdisciplinary design and research firm currently based in Morocco. Uh, their work addresses topics related to climate, ecology, human perception, the emergence of new technologies, and their ability to modify current modes of ex existence through Im imminent fictions. So, um, if we are ready, we would like to start with uh, Ms. Yasemin's presentation. Thank you very much, first of all, the organizers for this extremely interesting and timely event and, and for their kind uh, invitation. Um, so today I'm going to uh, draw primarily on, on our study as if it, um, if it is the earthquake engineering field investigation team that was set up uh, in 1984 under the Institution of Structural Engineering of this country. And since then, the, we have uh, conducted more than 60 missions to various earthquake and earthquake plus tsunami disasters around the, around the world. And you can actually um, access all the reports and, and mission lectures on the, on the website here. Um, as in all uh, major disasters, right after the uh, February earthquakes, the IFIT's management committee came, came together and they, they started to discuss whether or not 
this was an event that we wanted to study as part of the IFIT's, uh, IFIT's uh, activities. And the answer was an immediate yes. And, and the reasons are, are pretty obvious, I think. Here you are seeing a plot that, that shows the earthquake-induced impact in Turkey um, in the form of deaths, injuries, and, and the, the number of affected populations. And as you can see, there, there are a number of spikes here. One of them is the 1939 Erzincan earthquake, and the second one is the 1999 earthquake, which was, which was a, you know, one of the sort of major disasters from our recent uh, history. But then as you can see, the 2023 Kahraman Maraş events, it is, it is very, very significant compared to these two uh, previous, previous events even. Um, so obviously the sheer size of the, uh, the affected areas and the sheer size of the affected populations was therefore a very big basis for our agreeing to, to conduct this, this study. Um, some, other, some, of the, some of the other motivations that we had was, of course, the damage to the built environment and the fact that the built environment and the affected uh, areas being extremely rich in terms of the primary uh, structural systems, the materials, and, 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 uh, and so on and so forth. So there is actually a lot for us to, to learn as, as engineers from this, this event. The fact that uh, the initial response to the events was very problematic uh, was another uh, reason. The relief operations efficacy was, was very much under scrutiny and, and discussions by the media and the public uh, uh, alike. So therefore, we also wanted to look into this. There have been a number of instant collapse cases, which is such a red flag for us <coughs> structural engineers. So that's, uh, that's another reason. Uh, the fact that the, the, the strong ground motion characteristics of the event actually being really quite extraordinary, exceeding design spectrums in both horizontal and vertical components was of interest to us. And right before the event, actually, the Turkish seismic code was, was revised and a new set of codes uh, came in. So therefore, for us to understand how that actually mapped out on, on the damage that we were observing was, 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 again, something that we wanted to do. Um, the event took place uh, in conjunction with a lot of uh, infrastructure failure and some extraordinary weather events, actually. Some, some um, extraordinary cold in certain uh, locations, extraordinary precipitation and so on and so forth, turning this into some sort of multi-hazard uh, situation for, for some of the locations anyway. So that was another interesting thing. Of course, the area was, was, is very rich from a cultural heritage perspective, the demographic diversity, both from an ethnic and religious perspective. And you know, the whole context was, was very, very interesting. So we, uh, we decided to just, just go on and do this uh, right away. I also want to highlight um, for your attention that this was one of those events that received so much international interest that um, unlike many events that we have uh, taken part uh, in the past, this actually was coordinated at an international level in the sense that the post-disaster reconnaissance communities came together and they planned together, you know, who was doing what, when they were going to the, to the ground, etc. So we really tried to complement the efforts rather than doubling down efforts in this particular occasion. And one of the IFIT's specific uh, uh, aims has been to look into the rural settings because this was, we felt like at that time, was very much lacking in the general uh, post-disaster reconnaissance uh, attention. Um, I'm not gonna delve too much into this, but as you can see, we have set up the, uh, the team of uh, around 32 people, uh, and the team was, was split in two, the field team and the remote team, uh, to, to work uh, in collaboration with each other to collect the data and the evidence so that we can draw our, our key um, messages and, and observations. The team has been organized in the form of six working packages. As you can see, one looked into the seismotectonics and strong ground motion uh, characteristics, geotechnics, structures, infrastructure, remote sensing, and relief response recovery. Um, um, uh, as you can see, a very uh, brief uh, timeline of, of our study. Uh, we, as soon as we um, launched the team and started to work, we really waited for the very bright moment for us to go to the site because this was again one of those events where the search and rescue has continued for a long time and it was already very problematic. So we felt like going to the ground right away would be, would be you know, we would be an obstacle more than anything else because the resources were very, 
very scarce and, and, and the infrastructure was not fully operational. So we waited until we felt like we could now go and start looking around. So this happened in March, but uh, as you can see, we then have been to the site for another three times. So it was, it's been a four uh, field uh, visits uh, in total. And we have very recently, on the actually the very first anniversary of the event on the 6th of February 2024, we have released our reports both in English as well as a, uh, an, an expanded su summary uh, in Turkish. So uh, I am going to give a very little sort of, uh, um, you know, um, snippets of, uh, of information on, on various uh, sort of grounds. One of the issues, of course, the reinforced concrete buildings and, and how they performed. Uh, as you know, perhaps, uh, the Turkish built environment is very much characterized by the, the reinforced concrete uh, buildings. And as you can see on the pie charts on the left, uh, this is also the case for the affected areas uh, by these earthquakes, which means that reinforced concrete structures are actually really the main cause uh, for, the, for the casualties. Uh, on the right hand side here, you are seeing a summary of the, the, the damage assessment campaign that the Turkish Ministry of um, Environment, Urbanization and Climate Change has led. They have, they have done this very efficiently, very quickly on an extremely high number of buildings. And, and this is, and this is the, the breakdown of the outcome, uh, a very high number of collapsed or demolished buildings along with uh, the heavy and, and uh, moderate damage. There is quite a lot that we can say about the damage assessment protocols and the, the health of this exercise, but I am, you know, for time reasons, I'm not necessarily going to go into this. But again, uh, the, the reinforced concrete structures can be considered the main culprit here uh, for, for the high number of casualties. And the, the reasons are, 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 are widespread. I mean, you can see uh, that the detailing is wrong, the, the concrete uh, quality is very poor, design problems, and so on and so forth. But the, um, and this, this has been discussed quite widely elsewhere, so I'm not going to delve too much into it. But what I would like to highlight for your attention is that the problems that we are seeing with the reinforced concrete building stock is across the full life cycle of structures, i.e., they might not have been designed properly uh, or they might not have been implemented on the ground, even if they are designed properly on paper, they, the implementation on the, on the site might not have been done properly. Or we actually do see quite commonly that in the post-occupancy uh, uh, stage, the buildings might have been severed in such a way to compromise, uh, that compromises their seismic resilience. And this is something, again, that, that, that we have seen time and again uh, in the 1999 earthquake, in the Izmir earthquake in 2020, etc. So the, the main problems, the, the, the main messages that we draw on the reinforced concrete building performance, unfortunately, do not change. So <clears throat> what does this mean? First of all, um, in this particular event, obviously this is a massive tragedy, but you know, when you look into the, the, the engineering characteristics of the event, etc., we are in quotation marks, lucky because the, the affected area has a very well distributed seismic network. So we are we we have a very uh, big uh, scientific opportunity to really study the characteristics of the ground motions and to map it onto the damage. So that that actually gives us some opportunity to really look into this deeply. Um, and one of the things that, you know, the shortcut con con uh, conclusions that we can draw, uh, however, looking into the damage, is that the very high vertical acceleration values and the soft soil conditions need to be incorporated in the building called revisions. Uh, and then, of course, we are seeing that most of the heavy damage, as you can see on that map, is actually really coinciding with the, with the fault lines, which, of course, is expected, but then again, it also highlights the importance of land selection uh, in, the, in those areas. So urban planning becomes uh, really important. This area has been uh, going through some very rapid and expensive, extensive urban expansion and densification. Uh, so rapid that it is little controlled, uh, etc. And this whole thing, of course, not, not solely, but primarily was led by the Syrian civil war. And all of these additional pressures, of course, put the, put the area in danger. We, we can see that quite clearly. Uh, but as I said, most importantly, I think this is, this is quite important. I mean, Turkey is a country that trains some of the best uh, earthquake engineers in the world. I mean, this is, this is, this is very uh, factual. And, and 
um, the technical know-how is very well. But despite that, we are actually going through this time and again every time a major earthquake happens, which really highlights that the seismic resilience is not only a technical problem. And I think one of the issues that we cannot really progress with this has been, to some extent, the compulsion to uh, simplify this as a technical problem, uh, overlooking um, some comp uh, 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 contributory factors such as the regulatory system, the bureaucratic hierarchy, legal, political background, and so on and so forth. And I think this holistic uh, approach to the risk management and seismic resilience has to come in. I don't know how, I am sure we're going to discuss, but this is one thing that I'd like to say. Another uh, building stock that, uh, that is very substantial in the areas that we looked into has been the monumental structures. Uh, I'm not going to give too much details, but we have looked into a high number of buildings, I think in around 40 in uh, Osmani, Iskenderun, Samanda, Altinus, and Antakya. Uh, and we, are, we, have, we have seen a widespread uh, sort of form of damages and damage mechanisms. Uh, etc. Um, the comprehensive documentation of pre-disaster architectural and technical features is essential and was mostly lacking for most of these monumental structures and our team actually has, uh, has uh, shared all the documentation that took place during our work with the relevant stakeholders with the hope that they can actually you know, make some contributions to the, to the, to the restoration work that, that's going to follow. Now, and of course, there, there are a lot of complexities here as well because there is this diverse uh, ownership structure, etc. But I still feel like the monumental structures uh, are, are to, to a large extent lucky in the sense that, that there is a very strong policy and guidelines, um, uh, you know, background that, that pinpoints their preservation because they are mostly listed structures. So there is a uh, relatively clear uh, pathway as to how you go about uh, intervening with these structures now. However, I think one extremely uh, weak um, point uh, in this, basically, um, uh, the, the built environment is the traditional structures because they are unlisted and because, therefore, they... Uh, they do not necessarily sit in a very clear, clear place as to you know how they are going to be approached to uh, now you know uh, with, with, you know in the aftermath of the of the uh, of the earthquakes. Now the area is be being very large. The typologies, the traditional building typologies that you see in this area is very very rich. It's beautiful. So, but you know if you simplify it we do see quite a high number of timber-framed uh, buildings. So the, the ground floor is uh, masonry of some description, and it can be, you know, it, it changes from place to place depending on the material availability and etc. And the upper stories are made of timber frame. We call these humush often, but humush is like a, 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 a building typology that has very common construction principles that apply everywhere, but can be achieved in such different detailing and such different materials uh, and so on and so forth. So humus, humus is a very common one. And then there is, of course, the unreinforced masonry uh, structures, primarily in stone in the area. So um, two of our four um, field trips actually focused specifically on the traditional buildings, and we have surveyed a high number of buildings for our engineering assessments. Um, so Humush uh, is really, I mean, not only for the area under scrutiny here, but for the whole Turkey and also beyond in Greece and Balkans and whatnot, it's the predominant traditional building typology, first of all. And the Humush's earthquake resistance have been shown previously by many um, post-disaster reconnaissance studies, whether in Turkey or in Greece or in Balkans and whatnot, but also analytically and experimentally. So we do have this notion that humus actually lasts, uh, you know, under earthquakes for a number of reasons that, you know, we can discuss if, you, if you're interested, but, you know. And, and our observations here actually are very much in line with that. You know, we do see damaged buildings, but when we see damage in those buildings, the damage is often um, concentrated on the ground floor, uh, the masonry elements, and especially if 
the masonry ground floor was not constructed using some sort of tie beaming and the sort of traditional strengthening methods that we often see. You know, and there are those buildings that do not have these and they are, they are damaged sometimes, but they actually uh, performed really well uh, you know, compared to some other uh, building uh, typologies that we're observing in the area. Um, the thing is, now that these buildings are damaged, and they have been damage assessed by the ministry. Now, this is very. I, I, this is a point that I really feel quite strongly about. So, you know, let me highlight this. Now, the ministry is doing this damage assessment with their own personnel plus a very high number of volunteers who are not trained for damage assessing this very interesting traditional typology, whose construction features and characteristics are completely different from a typical reinforced concrete building, for example. So therefore, their, uh, their safety thresholds are very different. Their, um, you, know, the, the, you need to understand the building to be able to pass any judgment as to whether that building should be now taken down or not. And exclusively, all Humish buildings that we have observed on site were categorized with damage classes that were higher than what they should be which means that a very high portion of these buildings are now facing the threat of being demolished whilst they actually could be easily repaired. Not only that this is a major problem, obviously, but also the residents, obviously, if your building is, is categorized with a moderate damage and you know, a higher uh, damage category, you are not allowed to go in there and take anything from your building anymore. But uh, most of these buildings have structural or non-structural elements crafted by the family's, family's elders. Okay? And this was a point that, that pains very much the people who lived in those buildings. So therefore, I thought that I would report back to you. Um, and again, this is, I think, a very interesting slide. On the left-hand side, you are seeing a picture that has been pretty popular at the time in 1999. You are seeing a Humish building on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, there is a reinforced, reinforced concrete building. And while the, the former is just standing just, just fine, the, the latter is, 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 uh, is damaged. And on the right-hand side, we actually the same thing. On the right-hand side, in the little sort of red, red square, you are actually seeing a reinforced concrete building that's completely uh, collapsed. This, by the way, this is, of course, not to compare the reinforced concrete building technology against Humish building technology, because when you do reinforced concrete buildings in the right way, they should also perform well. But this is to compare some of the poorly done reinforced concrete buildings in Turkey to the Humish technology. Um, Okay, I already said that these buildings are categorized with higher damage categories, which is, which is uh, really uh, uh, quite problematic. So what we, uh, what we um, uh, suggest is that there are you know, some, some clear guidelines as to the damage assessment of this particular building stock is to be developed and, and, and the, the personnel who is going to take part in these damage assessment exercises to be trained on, on these. Uh, and then when it comes to the unreinforced uh, masonry structures, we see, of course, an increase in the partial total collapse cases. Uh, but let me say that the reason for this, actually, is that most of these stone uh, unreinforced, re unreinforced masonry structures are located in Antakya. And for some reason, um, I, I really would like to hear some architectural historian or you know, construction technologist to, you know, to, to speculate on the whys, because I don't. In Antakya, we really do not see very much the timber tie beaming in these, in these buildings for some reason. There is not that um, traditional strengthening uh, me measures put in place for Antakya traditional unreinforced masonry uh, building stock for some reason, and, and they, were, they were damaged uh, more than the Humish ones, for example. Um, and yeah, I mean, and, and, and there are entire villages, especially in Samanda, where these, these buildings are now taken down and probably will be replaced very soon by some reinforced concrete structures. Um, Okay, maybe I'll just pass this. <clears throat> okay, I, I just thought that I'll also say a few things about relief response recovery uh, operations from our perspective. 
so as you can see, there has been, sorry, there has been, uh, you know, very large areas, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting demolished and then temporary housing uh, put in place. We have observed a very high number of problems, actually, with the planning and, and implementation, again, of these uh, temporary housing. Uh, but now, of course, you know, the temporary housing changed as well. You know, first people were put in some tents and now they were moved to the containers. Some of the major problems that we have seen was, of course, infrastructure, running water, the lack of running water, the toilets, uh, the overcrowding, et cetera, et cetera. We have, we have been reported that some children actually died, unfortunately, in those temporary housing areas because, you know, there's, there's just some water um, tanks and, you know, um, uh, you know, places where water is kept and, you know, and things, things were really haphazard and, and uh, we have heard that I think two, two or three kids um, drowning in, in them. And then uh, before summer, uh, the people were moved into containers, but uh, as you know, the affected areas here are one of the, are among the hottest in summer in Tur Turkey. And uh, if the containers didn't have any AC um, installation, then it really made it extremely difficult for people to, to live in them. Uh, so they actually really had to spend their, their whole day outside uh, trying to find some shade, trying to find some, find some refuge from the, from the heat, which was very, very difficult. Again, we were report, reported quite commonly that especially women with, with young children really suffered from it because you know, like you don't have much, much to do, much to, you know, much, much places to go. Um, I'm really giving snippets of things here, but, you know, again, for example, debris management and demolishment practices were proven very, very problematic. In often cases, we have seen that they, they used water to control the, the particle uh, production during the demolishment, but the water, uh, the use of water anyways was not uh, very common, necessarily systematic everywhere, but, but also not necessarily sufficient to, to control. So when you were in a city center, especially in those places where demolishment was extremely widespread, such as in Kahramanmaraş or Antakya, you really could not breathe very, very well. And then the debris management, of course, we have seen, for example, that um, the very valuable ag agricultural lands used for, for um, uh, how do you call it, getting uh, disposed of, of the debris uh, and uh, really, really close to the sort of uh, water uh, sources, rivers and, and uh, streams and whatnot. And considering that a very significant portion of the, the, the debris that is coming from a pre-2000 buildings where there is absolutely no regulation against using asbestos, uh, meaning that you are not only essentially raising all the asbestos and, and making sure that it's a part of the, the urban air where everybody is breathing, but also you are then carrying all that sort of asbestos debris in, into your sort of land and, and water, uh, etc. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, asbestos isn't digested, you know, if you actually, for example, eat it or, or whatever, it doesn't really harm you. But then, you know, the mid to long term implications of all this, of course, have to be, have to be considered and I am not sure if they are. Um, and then, of course, the area is, uh, the, the population has this profile that a lot of people actually have their gardens and have their lands. Even if they are not producing the, for example, food, and you know, if they are not doing the orcharding for their own, for sorry, for for selling, so they to to make their lives, they actually consume a lot of what they grow in their gardens, and uh, and they were not able to do that anymore because, of course, all the sort of cementious uh, sort of particles that are constantly in circulation in the air made uh, anything and everything inconsumable. So whatever they, for example, produced uh, apples and whatever, for example, in their gardens, they actually were not able to eat it anymore. We were reported by a number of families. Um, what else? The affected area in Turkey, Turkey is home to a lot of different ethnic and religious backgrounds. And, and uh, what we have uh, also um, seen that we have, we have visited uh, some uh, Chechenian villages, some um, Armenian villages, uh, and um, a lot of uh, ma many diverse Christian uh, sort of uh, communities, etc. These communities, actually, these minority communities, actually have tackled the whole process a little bit better, perhaps in a way, because they 
were able to rely on this alternative networks of uh, cooperation and coordination, which the rest of the population didn't. Um, so they, they, for example, didn't necessarily have to wait for a tent coming from uh, coming from Afat, for example, but they actually could, for example, liaise with sort of little sort of groups of the, their communities spreading not only across Turkey but perhaps uh, abroad as well. And you know, they uh, we our our impression from uh, a number of specific interactions that we had with with such communities. Uh, told us that they uh, they actually um, really benefited from this alternative networks of coordination, which actually tells us a lot about um, the drawbacks of this highly centralized approach that we have in Turkey. I mean, not only in the first response, but also in the sort of subsequent stages of of relief and and, and recovery. Um, these alternative networks are extremely beneficial. Um, so Toki buildings, Toki is, uh, for, uh, for the information of some of you, uh, is the departmental, the governmental department that was set up some time ago for managing the whole, where it's basically housing, social housing and whatnot in Turkey. And they use this construction technique that is known as tunnel form, which is characterized by a very high amount of shear walls compared to a traditional conventional reinforced concrete building. And these performed very well owed to these, these shear walls. And now uh, the whole um, reconstruction efforts in Turkey is uh, using this approach. So what I'm saying is that everywhere now we are having these Toki buildings, which is good because we know that they are performing very well. But then, of course, it also means that there is a monochromatic approach to, to rehousing. because so there is this sort of relay um, sort of one line, you know, one, how do you call it, like, you know, very uh, sort of broad brush sort of approach to the rehousing. And of course, the whole diversity and richness of living cultures in the area and uh, the, the, the building and construction uh, cultures is, is uh, facing um, a threat of uh, homogenization. I thought that I would also show you this because this, this chart, um, can be a little bit too complicated to digest now, but let me uh, tell you that it actually shows you the discrepancy between where the house owners and tenants find themselves in the whole effort of, of uh, rehousing. Now, if you were a house owner and if your home was damaged during the earthquake, you are okay because then you are directed to the tents, you are directed to the containers, and then you are given a toki home if you can wait long enough, you know, you can hope that you are going to be given a Toki uh, flat. However, if you're a tenant, you, after the container point, you actually don't know where you're going because the Toki houses are not offered to tenants. What the government does in, in its stead is to give the tenants some rent assistance, i.e. some sum of money every month that they can use towards the rent. However, we have done, and you can look into the details of this in our report, we have done some rental uh, price research, uh, and we have seen that the, the, the amount of rental assistance that these people are given, as you can see, can barely cover the rent for even the smallest apartments in Antakya, for example, if we want to look into this. So it's very, very little compared to what they need to be able to sort of, you know, find some sort of a decent dwelling. And this means that one of the drivers, one of the drivers anyways, um, the sort of the population is going down and the city is getting empty is like partly down to, down to this. What happens in its stead, people, instead of staying in Antakya because they can't afford it, Antakya is just an example, but you know, they, a lot of people actually move outside the, the area where they used to live, where they have the social capital, where they have uh, the familiarity and whatnot, and go to the other cities. Mersin, for example, has been one of the cities that received a lot of uh, uh, migration. It's a, it's an, it's a uh, city that's in the, in the area but hasn't been affected to, from the earthquakes that much. But then uh, also to Istanbul, Ankara and Izmir, Meaning that there are mid to long term implications for cities, for Turkey in general, that goes above and beyond the earthquake hit area. Uh, we are hearing that, the, again, the rental market is in perturbation in those areas because of the large volumes of, of people moving in. 
the infrastructure uh, sort of struggling to uh, to cater to that many people and so on and so forth. So again, uh, this shows that we really cannot quite operate with very shortcut solutions, but you know, one needs to think in the long term to see uh, you know, how things are going to be. Okay, very, very quickly, last words. We are seeing that you know, everywhere, and all sorts of industries, of course, all about profits, but you know, in Turkey, we are seeing that the construction sector, unfortunately, is very much characterized by that. So it's very important that the auditing and quality control mechanisms are, are in place and they are, they are, um, they are more operational than, than, than they are now. The legalization of non-compliant buildings through amnesties cannot continue and has been identified as one of the, of course, issues that we are seeing here. Um, it's, it's very important, as I said, like not an oversimplistic look into the seismic resilience in Turkey or elsewhere, but it's, it's just a very uh, sort of broad issue which requires a multi-sectoral uh, engagement uh, with, uh, with uh, sort of a lot of disciplines. We are also, I also thought that I would mention that currently the reconstruction efforts are underpinned by two policy, let's say, um, uh, developments uh, in Turkey right now. I don't know if you discussed this in the morning. One of them is the reserve area system, okay? And the reserve area system actually gives the government uh, the full uh, operational uh, uh, independence to say that, okay, this area, is not uh, earthquake safe, so I'm taking it over and I'm going to do something with it. And you know what, what is really informing that decision and what happens next isn't very clear. And then there is a very recently launched law number 7441, which actually is all about establishing more funds for the reconstruction. Again, where the money is coming from and how it's allocated isn't clear at all. So what I want to say here is that you know things are happening uh, with with all the goodwill. Uh, we might think, and you know, they and hopefully are, but they they do not give the communities enough confidence about uh, or better certainty about what awaits them. And currently, really, every time we go to the field or every time we are in touch with the people there, the uncertainty is the biggest issue. And none of this is actually taking that away. So communication on what is happening, what is the decision making process, how we implement, you know, certain rules, etc has to be extremely detailed and has to be communicated much better to the people for, for, um, for um, a sort of more healthy uh, recovery, let's say. And last but not the little, uh, least, uh, the resilience as a systems problem. Uh, so we really have to be engaging with uh, you know, lots of sectors to make this work. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am unfortunately going to have to leave and I am not going to basically uh, be here for the um, round table discussions. But if you draw me a, a line on this, on this email, I'll be very happy to get back to you. And these are our uh, reports and, and the Turkish summary for your later reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.